The NDAA, so this defence appropriation bill that was passed by President Obama on New Year's Eve, allows for arbitrary and indefinite military detention of anybody anywhere in the world at any time, whether they're a US citizen or not, on the merest hint of suspicion of terrorism or aiding terrorism or aiding somebody who might be aiding terrorism. It's an incredibly broad and scary net that's been cast across the whole world, really, through this extraordinary claim of extraterritorial power by the United States government. I think it's not too difficult to draw these two things together, that you've got the US that has shown that it's happy not just to detain people indefinitely in places like Guantanamo Bay and Bagram, but also kill them by a drone strike from the air that then they're formalising those powers into these laws which say we can pinch you and hold you indefinitely forever if there may or may not down the track be some charges related to terrorism. While we've got senior political and diplomatic figures in the US accusing the WikiLeaks organisation of being terrorists, I think 10 years ago probably we'd have been accused of being conspiracy theorists from drawing those two things together. But the fact is the US government is drawing them for us. They, uh, military prosecutors, right, I think it was on the last day of the Manning trial, ran a video of an Al-Qaeda operative saying, study the internet, use the resources of the free internet for whatever ends, for picking targets or for whatever. And the prosecutors are using that argument to say WikiLeaks is aiding the enemy. And that means the New York Times is aiding the enemy. It means you and I are probably aiding the enemy. It means Australia's Fairfax press are aiding the enemy. And that these laws of indefinite and arbitrary detention, maybe that means they come into play if we're all aiding Al-Qaeda. It's a terrifying erosion of the rule of law. And I am very concerned about the direction in which, not necessarily the Obama administration, but the people underneath it who appear to be running things are pushing us in this really queasy direction. I think it will have direct bearing on the work of civil society organisations like WikiLeaks or even groups like the occupiers around the world who in London found themselves on the Met Police's terror list. That's where this is going. Well, that was one of my questions to Noam Chomsky. I said, well, you know, it's almost a once upon a time thing. There was the high tech terrorist, there were the low level terrorist and was just going to ask you if you thought there were any happy medium terrorists as well. And of course he laughed, but it's not funny, you know. It's so vague that anybody, as you say, could be defined as a terrorist because of their associations. And those associations can be just reading or talking to. uh... It could be fundraising. You know, in Australia, we're on our own slippery slope here with these expanding definitions of terrorism bleeding across into what most people would consider just regular criminal acts or acts of dissent. You know, the Sea Shepherd Conservation Society uh, are accused by the Japanese government of being terrorists as well because they push boundaries and they put themselves into harm's way. The problem really that we have is that if you're going to apply these incredibly draconian laws to these various categories of offences known as terrorism, you have to be very, very careful as to how those offences are drafted. I don't think anybody in the United States or Australia or anybody in the world condones the kind of extreme acts of politically motivated violence and murder, mass murder, Mm -hmm. that most people accrue to the idea of terrorism. We're thinking of indiscriminate killings of civilians in railway stations and hotels and so on as terrorism. Trying to disrupt a whale hunt by throwing some kind of stinky liquid at a whaling ship is not terrorism. Publishing documents in the public interest exposing war crimes is not terrorism. Occupying a city square because you're disgusted with the extreme excesses of capitalism is not terrorism. It's enormously risky for intelligence services and clandestine organisations to have their roles blurred to the degree where they're spying on people who are really just sometimes putting themselves into harm's way or promoting effectively further democratisation of our society and doing these things in the public interest. There's a problem of sovereignty there as well. I mean, how can America attack other countries' citizens? That's a big question. I guess that's what Professor Chomsky's been writing about for decades. It's just been pushed into perverse new directions in the last little while. The United States has realised it can't keep two massive armies in the field at the same time and still expect to stay solvent. 
while financial markets are melting down. So they're outsourcing the killing to robots and to these nasty little drone aircraft like computer games mm -hmm. from nearly anywhere in the world, uh, which is a much cheaper way of killing people. But of course, it means that the death toll is still indiscriminate. It's still large and nobody really knows exactly how many people are being killed by these things. Mm -hmm. And nobody's very sure how the United States government justifies that legally mm -hmm. the extrajudicial killing from the air with high explosives of people in Yemen or in Pakistan or in places where no war has been declared. And I'm not sure that that many people realise how widespread it is. Yeah. As I said, I'm staying with a lawyer at the moment and I was, I was asking him about whether international law which says that Bradley Manning was right in doing what he did. Does that override American law? And he said, well, yeah, normally it should, but only if America agrees that it should. And he said in the past, they have agreed with international law when it went in their favour and totally just walked out of the courtroom when it wasn't in their interest. So who is to mm. uphold international law? Well, I think we all have to. And of course, the United States government's not the only one violating international law when it suits it. That's something that can cut in all different directions. So we've got to be a little bit careful here that that the US isn't the only state that's taking advantage of the institutional weakness of international legal frameworks. I think ultimately it's self-defeating and enormously destructive. But institutions like the United Nations are, at the moment, they're all we have. Yeah. Uh, I think the problem is immediately you run into arguments of global government and potentially just making things worse if you set some international framework that nation states have to subordinate themselves to. Mm. But the fact is they already do because corporations already are on that stage and citizens of countries and human beings don't really have those or they're much weaker. So that empty space is being exploited in, in the instance of this conversation by the United States government mm -hmm. to say, we can arbitrarily choose a particular house in a particular country in some part of the world and obliterate it mm -hmm. and not report on that and kill large numbers of people and still claim some kind of international legal immunity for that. If other governments do that, it's terrorism. Yeah. That's what we understand terrorism to be. Yes. Our international legal frameworks have been put together painstakingly over decades or centuries really and they're not really up to the task of this voracious global hypercapitalism, where corporations do operate at a global level and have their own rules-based system such as it is through institutions like the WTO and, and the IMF and so on but there's no equivalent framework with any kind of democracy to it and as soon as you step in that direction people accuse you of pursuing world government what we've got at the moment is a kind of anarchic corporate world government where nation states claiming their own national interest will do things claiming extraterritoriality which is really what the US is doing with these drone strikes and with the NDAA and we have no international legal frameworks to constrain those because we haven't evolved them yet and at some point I think we're going to need to confront the fact that these people got there first. We have international laws of war, we have international humanitarian law, we have a treaties based system that's been enormously valuable in reining in things like cluster weapons and landmines and, and eventually nuclear weapons. It's not that there's no hope, but these things are fragile and you need to take a position of global citizenship really to make them work. The greatest failure, if you will, that you can see, I suppose, at the moment is climate change where people come together, they're all representing their own national interest in a zero-sum game. We're all sitting in a boat full of holes and nobody's bailing because everybody's looking around and nobody else is bailing, so the damn thing is sinking. We need something where human beings are represented in these fora because actually nation states don't appear to be up to the job. And I think you could make very similar observations in the instance of the kind of work that WikiLeaks is doing. You know, look, if the war logs and the State Department cables had disclosed that when war crimes were committed and when people were murdered quite casually, wrongly, in instances like the collateral murder footage, 
that there were court martials and there were inquiries and people lost their jobs and lessons were learned. But I think the reason that these whistleblowers and the publishers who've put them into the newspapers have proceeded is that that is precisely the opposite of what occurs. These crimes are committed with absolute impunity. If you, if you read what Private Manning was telling the hacker guy in the chat logs that, that Wide magazine published. Adrian Lamo. Yeah, he's talking about doing this in the public interest and putting himself on the line. And if it's him, those things haven't been validated yet. But if you read him on face value, he's preparing to put himself at risk because he's sick of the degree to which people are being lied to and people are dying around these lies. That's an extraordinarily brave thing to do, this idea that because he signed an oath, it meant he was therefore obliged to turn a blind eye to war crimes. Actually, those defences were demolished at Nuremberg in the 1940s. The problem is that it seems to be shut inside a military pen. And what the left or the right think, it's quite irrelevant because the military just clear the courtroom. Those who have been there are very pessimistic and are telling Julian to run. Yeah, but run where? Run where? where? Should you run? And why should the innocent run? Right. So, yeah, I think that's highly problematic. I can see the reason for the pessimism and my news of the pre-trial stuff was all secondhand, obviously, but... Yeah. We need to have safe harbours for journalists and for publishers and for people producing this material if it's in the public interest. And it's not acceptable that he should have to run, that he should have to spend his life being chased from one country to another, dodging extradition requests and so on. I think he should be able to come back to Australia. I think he'd get a pretty good reception back here, to be honest. Yeah, well, these are Americans who are terrified of their own military, in fact. Well, these things come in cycles and the American people have a remarkable history of renewal and self-renewal and it's never been needed more than now, but it has happened before. I'm not completely pessimistic at all about the direction of things in the United States because they're also producing some of the sharpest critiques, some of the best activism, some of the most lively campaigning, some of the funniest work as well people there aren't taking it lying down. Millions of people are standing up. It's being contested and challenged all over the place.